When most people think of pirates, they think of the 18th century type, the swashbuckling, pistol-carrying, peg-legged, eye-patched, hats, parrots, that kind of thing. Not so much about these guys. <coughs> the idea of dinghies full of men wearing sandals, carrying AK-47s, crashing into oil tankers and other large ships and then holding them for ransom caused many people to say, You are without doubt the worst pirate I've ever heard of. The popular internet memes seeming to reply, But you have heard of. In any case, the resurgence of piracy in the 21st century originating on the Somali coast has caught the imagination of a lot of people. And there is also a much more serious side, of course, rather than just joking around about it, which is what I want to look into in this video on Somali piracy and how come in the 21st century a concept like pirates is still possible. Before walking straight off the plank and plunging into the ocean to talk about this deep topic, I want to have a quick word from our sponsor, Magellan TV. Magellan TV is a paid for video streaming service with thousands of documentaries that you can watch. They cover many different topics like science, nature and history that you can gain access to with a small monthly fee. Now I would like to recommend one in particular which is called Somalia the Pirate Tapes which is about this precise topic and is a great watch because it's about a documentary maker, a Somali himself, who infiltrates a pirate operation so you can see how they manage to do these piratical expeditions from from the ground itself, or I should say from the sea. So it's a really great watch and you can have access to this and many other documentaries on similar topics by going to Magellan TV. There's even a special offer for viewers of this channel. You can either go to the description or simply type try.magellantv.com slash history with Hilbert for a free month of premium membership. It's really worth checking out. So do check it out because that does help out the channel as well. And you can get access to all these great documentaries. But anyway, let's dive into it. Somalia is a country in the Horn of Africa. Its position facing the Indian Ocean as well as the Arabian Peninsula, making it an important maritime culture already since ancient times and being part of several trade routes. Various sultanates that developed in the region looked to the north in terms of their religion, which became Islam spreading from the Arabian Peninsula, as well as their diplomatic ties. Although this would be challenged in the 19th century within the scramble for Africa by the British and the Italians, both of whom created colonies after much struggle from the native population in this region of the Horn of Africa. This changed in 1940 with the arrival of the Second World War into Africa and the Italians from Italian East Africa invaded British Somaliland, thus making it their own and annexing it as part of their territorial holdings, as well as of course Ethiopia, which they had conquered some years before. The British didn't let the situation lie, however, they regrouped their forces from Kenya and invaded, making the whole region British. So the Italian presence had ended. But that wasn't quite the end of the story, and these divisions within Somalia would become incredibly important for later developments in the country. In 1945, following the Potsdam Conference, the UN agreed to give Italy trusteeship over what had been Italian Somaliland whereas British Somaliland would remain under British sovereignty. This was proposed by the Somali Youth League on the condition that within 10 years they would be given their independence. And this duly occurred in 1960 with the merger of Italian Somaliland and British Somaliland into one united nation of Somalia. Now things weren't smooth sailing however as just nine years later in 1969 the president was shot and into the power vacuum stepped a certain Mohammed Said Bar who was one of the generals in the army thus starting a period of military dictatorship over the country. He formed the Somali Revolutionary Socialist Party or SRSP for short and turned the country towards the left meeting with certain socialist leaders like Nicolau Ceausescu from Romania at the time. In 1977 things went south of the country however as they invaded Ethiopia in what became known as the Ogaden War trying to annex a part of Ethiopia that had Somali citizens. The USSR and other communist powers strongly disproved of this war and actually sent support to the enemy of Somalia and stopped backing Somalia to the Ethiopians. The Cubans, for example, sending tens of thousands of soldiers and thus turning the tide of the war against them. This led to growing disenfranchisement and in 1980 the SRSP was disbanded. Ethiopia hadn't forgotten the attempt of its neighbour to annex part of its territory and actually started to now back guerrilla and separatist groups within Somalia who were growing increasingly disillusioned with the Bar regime. One of these groups was the Somali National Movement or SNM in the north of the country. 
This group, for example, was the area that had been British Somaliland and still had a different identity to large parts of the rest of Somalia, and so they were fighting to gain their own independence away from the Ba regime, which in turn responded with increasing violence and troops, as well as a genocide against several of the peoples in the north. In 1988, this would culminate in the Somali Civil War and in 1991, Ba would be deposed. However, it's following Ba's deposition that Somalia really was plunged into chaos. This is because within the power vacuum, many rebel groups stepped up to the plate and attempted to seize power for themselves. Already in 1991, that northern part of the country we were talking about declared itself independent and became Somaliland as opposed to Somalia and is pretty much an autonomous entity, although it's not recognized internationally. This declaration of independence went largely unopposed because in the rest of the country, especially in the south, civil war and intermittent violence was commonplace and there was no real central authority. The two figures claiming to rule were Muhammad Farah Aidid and Ali Mahdi Muhammad, whose militias were in a violent struggle against one another. A conference held in the neighbouring country of Djibouti, which Aidid boycotted, actually said that Mahdi was the rightful claimant to the government and should be recognised as the new power in Somalia, the Somali government. And this was rectified by Djibouti, Saudi Arabia, Egypt and Italy, all of whom recognised Mahdi as the official government in Somalia. However, Aidid was not best pleased and the violence continued, leading to the UN sending in the United Nations Operation in Somalia, or UNOSOM. Now in 1993, Aidid, who was very disillusioned with the situation in the UN troops, ordered his soldiers to attack Pakistani peacekeepers in the capital Mogadishu, and this is also the episode in which the Black Hawk Down film is set when they shot down a Black Hawk helicopter and American soldiers in the streets of Mogadishu when it turned increasingly violent against the UN peacekeepers. And this led to such a carnage in Somalia that the UN mission actually pulled out in 1993 and had to reanalyze its strategy in dealing with it. So how does all this tie into Somalia's resurgence in pirate activity? The Somali Civil War meant there was a constant supply of arms and people who knew how to use them within Somalia, as well as the fact that there was no central government, which meant that crime that would normally be sorted by a police force or a coast guard was also not being dealt with, as well as extreme poverty in the country because of all the conflict going on and the famines that were ensuing around them. The Somali navy was disbanded in 1981 along with the Baal regime and so it meant that apart from not just being able to go out and to deal with people committing illegal acts on the water and piracy is an extreme form of that, it also had a deeper implication which was that they couldn't police Somali waters from foreign vessels which have to obey by Somali laws. This is a real problem because Somalia actually sits on one of the migratory routes of some of the largest tuna in the world as well as many other fish species which makes the Somali coast incredibly rich for fishes. Now the thing is that there were Somali local fishermen but that with the coast guard gone and the navy non-existent and the country in turmoil, foreign fishing trawlers, these huge ships, could come and make a huge profit at the expense of the local Somali fishermen and in violation of Somali laws. Traditionally, Somalis hadn't eaten much fish and preferred to eat their livestock from inland like goats, but with all the hunger crises and food shortages caused by the wars and famines on the land, the sea became a much more important resource for Somalis to get their food but they were also quickly losing the ability to fish and in some of the encounters between themselves and foreign fishing trawlers, several fishermen were killed. This as well as the possibility that there was illegal dumping of toxic waste into the sea that also killed many fish and affected the people of the local environment. Another important factor to remember is that Somalia's position along the coast and close to the Gulf of Aden not only gave it access to this prime supply of fish, but also meant that there was always a lot of sea traffic of these large ships with cargo and other things, trading vessels going past since the ancient times. And certainly by the 1990s, this was one of the busiest stretches of sea in the world. And so what started off most likely as local fishermen banding together to protect their own interests and their own lives and the fish that they relied upon for their food and their livelihoods, 
turned it into something else. And actually, you can see this origin in the Somali name for what they call these pirates, which means something like the saviors of the sea. It's also a word that's used for coast guard. So initially, perhaps, this is the origin of the pirate phenomenon, was that there were these local fishers who felt they were being cheated out of the fish that was off their shore and, you know, rightfully by law, would have been protected by a Somali coast guard that didn't exist. And so they had to form it themselves. But what they found is that around the year 2000, perhaps starting a little earlier than that, they found that the best way to get attention was actually to board these vessels that were coming here, so these fishing vessels, and then to take the fishing vessel or the, the large ship as a hostage, to take it back to the Somali coast and then to ask for a ransom. And this is when these small groups of, let's call them, militia coast guards really transformed into the pirates that we now associate today. The modus operandi was one of sailing out from the Somali coast onto these lanes where there were so many ships that were sailing and then to find one, to board it, to capture the crew and then to ransom the ship and essentially the lives of the crew back to their owners. And this was a much more profitable way of making money than was fishing. And so I think many of these initially fish coast guards actually turned into pirates, but that also just many criminals from the land realized they could make a lot of money on the sea and so went out. Now, this exponentially became far more lucrative in a very short amount of time. So in 2005, uh, a random ship that they captured uh, was, was then ransomed back at $315,000. Whereas in 2007, just two years later, they captured another ship that was then ransomed back for a million and a half dollars. And then in 2011, they ransomed another ship that was worth six million, or they were ransoming it for six million. So they realized they could bunk the price up hugely. And these are huge amounts of money, especially for a country like Somalia. Now, in total, they think that in 2009, the complete earnings of pirates was something like $58 million, but that by 2010, just a year later, this had grown by a huge amount to $238 million. And so you can see why to many in Somalia, a war-torn, ravaged country where many people struggle to buy food, such an alternative was actually very much welcoming. This amount of money was a very alarming prospect for the international community, and so a naval task force containing naval vessels of many different countries was sent out to the Somali coast to try and deal with it, but there were several problems. One was that they really couldn't enter Somali waters, and they could only actually intervene with a hijacking before the Somali pirates had got on board. This is actually very interesting because this goes down to various countries having different laws to do with piracy, some of which are really old, going back to the 17th century or earlier, and others being a lot more modern as well as the very tricky situation with having to respect Somalia's laws as a country, but the fact that Somalia had, you know, basically no government that was ruling it at the same time. So while a normal country would have a coast guard that would deal with this kind of thing, Somalia didn't. And so, you know, they were having to watch as people in flip-flops and with Kalashnikovs were taking over vessels and taking people hostage. Also very frustrating for them was that a lot of the time when they captured these pirates, they were advised to just let them go because of legal complications with taking them from the sea, from Somalia, and then charging them elsewhere. And a lot of the time they just had to let them go back to land which must have been incredibly frustrating. I'm going to make a separate video about this specifically with regard to the Dutch and Belgian role in taking down the Somali pirates which is a very interesting historical link to earlier Dutch uh, attitudes towards pirates and fighting against them but that's for another video. But essentially the Somali pirates also they this is a huge area it's not just along the Somali coast that they would attack these vessels but they realized the whole Indian Ocean was open game and so the furthest away have been around a thousand kilometers away from Somalia is where the furthest out attacks against ships have been, making the whole region dangerous in the years around 2010. When looking at the people who these pirates actually are and where they came from in Somalia, some interesting things can be said. Most of them are young men of a not particularly wealthy background, and the majority of them are thought to have originated in this kind of area, this central strip of Somali coastline, which is where they would go out. There was also a lot of activity in sort of the northern port areas, but that seems to have stopped around 2009, 2010, and that the majority actually after that region 
got a better grip on the piracy situation on land, the majority of piracy now originates from the central region or from the southern coastal area. It's found as well that about 80% of the pirates come from the south of Somalia, which is where the civil war has been the worst and the longest and goes on as compared to just 20% from the north, remembering that the uh, western side of the north is pretty much independent as Somaliland and the you know the the eastern part of the north actually is also fairly independent to a lesser degree an area called Puntland but it's interesting that the vast majority are from the south there are three main groups that we can associate with the pirates the first would be the local fishermen now as I said I think this is the really the origin of where the pirates came came from but they are ultimately also important for the pirate operations because they are the ones who need to handle the boats they know the area they know how to actually sail the ships and bring them back and so they're a vital part of the operation as are the militiamen so these are the grunts of the operation those who have weapons and I say know how to handle them are proficient enough to fire them let's say and many of these will have been militiamen that were involved within the Somali civil war that have been fighting on land and so they realized they could make a quick buck on the sea and so they in connection with the fishermen head out a third group probably a smaller group is of certain tech savvy individuals who know how to use the GPS because of course when they're out on the sea, sea is a very large place, they want to find the biggest ship, they want to know if there are enemy ships around, that kind of thing and so they need some kind of GPS uh, signaling so that they can find them. So these three different types of people work together to make the pirate ideal work. Now normally what they will do is they will go out in a kind of mothership with several smaller crafts so that they can go back in these smaller crafts and resupply on the ship and they have you know certain supplies and things and then when they capture a vessel they'll stay on that vessel they'll sort of take it with this mothership and bring it back to Somalia and from there you know they bring the hostages out and they hide them in the community and because international forces can't really go on land there it makes it very difficult for getting them back. Funding for these ships as well as the weapons, ammunition and supplies of the pirates comes from local investors on the land, people with money who buy a share into this raiding expedition and then if they come back of course they are earning millions so people will you know earn a lot of that as well as the rest of that amount being split among the pirates themselves in a sort of similar way to the first stock exchange that you had in places like Amsterdam with the VOC going out and uh, sailing to the Indies and coming back with spices if they returned successfully then people would get incredibly rich so it's interesting that actually there is stonks involved in Somali piracy at this level. Now because of all the destruction and devastation in Somalia there are many many different Somalis in lots of different countries around the world today. You might call it the Somali diaspora um, and these individuals often actually help in the Somali piracy in that they capture vessels that are being crewed from Asia, from Europe, with North Americans, with other Africans. And so because there are so many Somalis in different countries around the world, they probably use these Somalis as their translators, as their negotiators when dealing with the hostage situations. Although exactly how this works and how these contacts are maintained isn't entirely clear. What is also interesting is a potential connection between some of these pirate groups and Islamist organizations like Al-Shabaab who are in the south of Somalia going across the border there and fighting with other groups. Though again it's unclear how this is. Other extremist Islamist organizations have actually fought with the pirates in the past and pushed them out of the coastal towns when they gain control of such regions. Whereas sometimes the pirates do threaten when they have a hostage, that, especially a western hostage, that if the ransom money isn't paid they will deliver them to Al-Shabaab who will then behead them. So it's interesting to see but we shouldn't be seeing the pirates as being particularly uh, adherent to an extreme version of Islam because they are very often drunk and also often times addicted to the drug called khat which is a very common drug in Somalia that's eaten by chewing leaves. That brings us to their relationship with the people on the coast because as I said they need important figures on the coast to protect them on land from what little authorities there are as well as obviously to form a base and to keep the hostages when they're there and sometimes these hostages are kept for years upon years and so that requires the local community to support them as well as to fund their piracy 
pirate activities. So certain elements in the community have benefited from the piracy, but of course they do have these kind of drug-addled, arm-to-the-teeth, impatient young men going around with an awful lot of money in their pockets and actually it's oftentimes the case that the local fishers are now the ones who are suffering also from the pirates because of all these violent developments in the area and the fact that they go and they spend this money um, they have so much money that inflation has grown so much in Somalia that normal people earning a living by fishing can no longer afford basic goods because they're being driven out by these enormous amounts of money that the pirates have. And a lot of the time as well, this is a bit of a, a different argument, but that the pirates actually go elsewhere to spend this money rather than it benefiting the local community. As I said, inflation has gone through the roof in Somalia because not only of piracy, but also because of foreign aid not necessarily reaching the right places that it needs to in the region. But for the fish, it has been a positive story because so many international ships are scared of going to the Somali coast that fish stocks have actually really recovered quite well, especially if you compare this to the neighboring region of Tanzania where there has not been piracy, they have continued to plummet, whereas the Somali fish stocks are actually recovering. And I hope in the future that international fishing fleets will learn a lesson from Somali piracy in a way and maybe do a bit less fishing on that coast and have a bit more respect for the local fishermen. But we'll see. The heyday of Somali piracy was definitely in 2010, where they were raking in hundreds of millions of dollars in cash and also gaining widespread international fame for their actions. And of course, this was also partially their downfall because it led to this huge period of, of capturing people from different countries and demanding ransoms, also demanded actually something be done about it. So they did create another international fleet, a task force specifically designed to deal with Somali piracy involving many different nations around the world. And this has been incredibly successful as have private security firms on these various ships that go. Almost all ships that pass through that region now, uh, or well, at least uh, about five, six years ago, would they would all have private security on board and other measures to ensure that they weren't captured by Somali pirates. And this greatly deterred the pirate activities. This is also in combination with the building of a, a new naval base in the north of the country from which these international fleets can can operate. As well as actually in the northern region of Puntland there has been a lot of uh, actually building up of a new coast guard as well as onland authorities to deal with the pirates in towns like Ail where many of these pirate bands would go from and this also this approach from both the land and the sea has appeared to be very effective. And in 2013, this was the, the year in which the last unsuccessful attempt was made and that 90% of pirate activities had declined from the, follow the previous period in 2012. So that's really almost the end of the Somali pirates. However, in 2017, they did indeed capture another vessel but they soon released the crew that they had held hostage and it was quiet again for a few years until last year 2020 when several more attacks were made against different groups, although these again proved largely unsuccessful. But it does suggest that the age of Somali piracy might not be completely over. Anyway, I hope that you've enjoyed this video on why pirates are back again in the 20th century, specifically about Somali piracy, where it came from, what conditions allowed it to happen, and a little bit about the solution. If you found this video interesting, do let me know in the comments below, because as I said, there is a quite interesting story to tell about the the Dutch and Belgian efforts against piracy and to go a little bit more into why it was so difficult for these other nations to actually go in and just deal with the pirates and to blast them out of the sea uh, and how they got around it in some ways. But do let me know if you found this interesting. I thought it was a, a pretty interesting topic for a video and uh, yeah, let me know in the comments below. Give me a thumbs up if you did enjoy. If you're new, subscribe. Also check out Magellan TV. And if you like, the History with Hilbert merch store is now live. You can go over there and you can buy some merch if you like that kind of thing. I don't have any with Somali pirates, but if you want merch with Somali pirates on them, then let me know, I suppose. Anyway, I've been Hilbert and this has been the History.